the beauty, the complexity. We have so much to learn from forests. And this is for a good reason. The trees in the forest uptake the CO2 that we emit to the atmosphere. They grow and they make connections. They purify our water. They hold our soil. They give oxygen for everybody. But sometimes we forget to see the trees for the forest. Actually, we need to know that we are losing trees today at rates at unprecedented that were never seen here before. So because of climate change, because of droughts, hotter droughts because of global warming, we are losing more trees. And this is something that we study in my lab. So if you look at the reasons of why trees are dying today uh, more than ever, we found in the research that we did in Israel and later globally with the networks of scientists, four major reasons for that. So drought is killing trees in greater numbers. Drought become hotter and more frequent. Fire is causing devastating areas to collapse after uh, huge fires in Australia, in California, in Portugal, not far from here. And then when trees are weakened by drought, they are more susceptible for insect attacks, just like these um, bark beetles that attack the oak tree here. And in some areas, when trees are not adapted to heavy snow load, they can die from snowstorms. So this is something that happens everywhere. Let's zoom out a bit and see the bigger picture. If we zoom out from where we are now and we look at Europe, all these places are sites where you have documented mortality of forests and trees. And you can see that it's all over, even in Scandinavia, even in Spain. So when you look for the other side of the globe, again, the same picture of many documentaries of trees dying from climate change. For example, you see a lot of mortality up there in Canadian forests. So you would not imagine, but uh, is this drought? Is this heat? Most of the trees die because of the mountain uh, bark beetle. So is this even related? So take this. Every winter in Canada, temperature used to go down to minus 30 degrees Celsius. In recent years, it was just down to minus 25. So the uh, little eggs of these insects survived better. And when spring comes, then more insects are coming and attacking trees. And then in southwest of US and so on, you have direct drought that impact populations of trees there. And if we go back to where we are now uh, here, here in Switzerland, we think of Switzerland as a green, lush country, right? But even here, when we go to the south of Switzerland, where we have inner valleys in between the Alps, we have cases of pine trees dying again from drought. And if we go to another near valley in, in the canton of Valais, Valais, again, pine trees dying from drought or weakened by drought and then dead by mountain pine beetles. So this is something that happens everywhere and it should worry us. And when we go to Israel, you would not think of Israel as a forest country, but actually we do hold the world record in Israel of afforestation. So, so in 70 something years, we moved from 1% of forest area to more than 8%. This is a world record. It's not huge in area, but it's very diversified and we have many types of forest. And in our forest, we did the calculation for these 70 something years and saw that we are losing trees mostly in the last three decades at unprecedented rates. But when most people see despair, we see opportunity. Israel is the place to study forests and trees, ecosystems in general. If you start from the north, where you have Mount Hermon, which is alpine, and you go on to other uh, places in Israel where you have Mediterranean forest with pines and, and oak, there is high diversity. These are mixed forests that have been living there for ages. Uh, 
if you go to the center of Israel, you get to the semi-arid belt, where you have um, a semi-arid forest, more sparse, but again, with many secrets that we can unravel. And then down south, when you get to the desert, where you have in the Negev or in the Arava Valley, sparse vegetation, still you find in the uh, dry riverbeds many shrubs, which are specifically adapted to these conditions. And even here in Ramon crater, Mahtesh Ramon, we have acacia trees growing, which I will tell you more about very soon. So Israel is a diverse country. For a plant ecology, this is heaven. If you think about the precipitation gradient, these are the colors from wet to dry. We have a huge variance this is unparalleled in any other place, maybe California. And what we did in my lab, we went on and established a network of research stations in field sites. These are all these places that you see here with different species of trees which are of interest for us because these are the trees of hope. And these are the trees that we study to learn about the mechanisms, how we can prepare forests for a more sustainable future, a more resilient forest for the upcoming future. So let me give you some examples. So this is Acacia totilis, the um, Acacia tree um, learner family, you know this. So we found amazing mechanisms in this one single species that grows almost exclusively in the Negev desert. So for one thing, we hypothesized that the growth, these green leaves, despite the heat and the drought, are su supported by activity after flash floods or in the little rain that it does get in winter, it's quite the opposite. These trees don't care about the rain so much. They grow in August, in September. We measure temperature up to 45 degrees Celsius. We measured only 5% humidity and they still grow. What about the light? The, it's so bright, it's, it's even... Um, it's hard to see in the desert on a, on, a, on a summer day. When we took our machines to measure photosynthesis, it was a high curve always growing. So these trees can photosynthesize at higher rates than any other tree at very high light. We were unable to measure more, so we took and actually had to invent a new machine to measure the high light efficiency of this tree that was never seen before. So how can this be possible? In the middle of the desert, how can these acacia trees survive? We thought they have deep roots, but we didn't know that they actually have two root systems. And don't mind the Lorax there, but if you go below ground, you see up to eight meters away from a stem, you can still find the roots connecting to this single tree. And what we did to measure the depth was drilling just by, side by side by, with a tree taking the isotopes of water from depth and comparing them to the isotopes of water running through the stem of this acacia. And again, we found something between five and nine meters depth. So these three look small from, uh, from above ground, but actually they are very big in collecting water, the little water uh, below ground. Another example is coming from the Mediterranean forest. So we know different trees that, are, that have different physiologies and different um, appearances, like pine and oak and carob and pistachia. We know to identify them. But when we go down below ground, what we actually see is that they are very different below ground as well. As you can see here, some trees have extensive root systems, while others have very little, very shallow. So actually, when you come and compare a single species forest with a mixed forest, with a diverse forest that we have in Israel a lot from, we see that the mixed forest is much more productive. Why is that? So we discovered in my lab that when you put pine by a, a neighboring pine, they compete on the same very niche. When you mix them together, they can have different niches and they don't compete on water sources, which is the number one single most important driving for forest survival in Israel and in other semi-arid places. But actually, the most important part in my research is about something that we sometimes overlook when we go to the forest. And these are the very tiny creatures that grow side by side by trees 
and we like to collect, but we never think too much about. And we, no, we don't know that what we collect is just the tip of the iceberg, because these mushrooms here are the, just the fruit bodies of much bigger organism. Let's go down and see what's hidden there. So what we see is that these mushrooms create networks. We call them hyphae. These are fibers that grow anywhere in the soil and connect to the roots. This has been known for a while. It's a symbiosis where mushrooms can provide water and nutrients for the tree, and they get all their carbon from the tree through photosynthesis in the tree and through the roots. And this is what you see here. What was not known is actually that one mushroom is not necessarily loyal to a tree host. So mushrooms can actually go to one species or to two or three, or we found even five different species of trees that connect to the one single species of mushroom. And why do they do that? What does it all mean? So just a week ago, my postdoc, Stav, in my lab, showed me and shared with me her re recent discovery in an experiment that we did. We grew a pine tree next to an oak tree, and the oak tree was covered by a black sack, so it was actually suffering from deprivation. It, it did not see light, it could not photosynthesize, so it was just starving for carbon. If you ask me, if I was a fungi, I'm not getting any carbon from this poor oak, I will just leave it alone. But not the mycorrhiza, not these symbiotic fungi. So what we were able to show through isotope research is carbon going from a pine tree that is out there in the light, enjoying and photosynthesizing, going all the way to the roots of this pine, from the pine to the fungi, and then it's up to the fungi to decide. What the fungi did was astonishing. It took all that carbon and used it to maintain the oak tree. So the oak tree, that poor, was able to survive and stay green in spite of dark just because of the fungi. Why should any organism behave this way? Why is this altruism? So what we think now, and we are testing in my lab, is that actually there is benefit from the fungi for the fungi to connect with many tree species. We study a lot about the trees, so we know the pine trees are very active in winter, but at the same time, the oak trees are very active in summer. So by connecting to both, it can ensure itself a flow of carbon for the whole year round. So we think about these magnificent networks and we study the compounds that are being transferred and the chemicals that we are now identifying, some of them are emitted to atmosphere. These are volatile organic compounds. Others are going below ground to allow communication. And we think about another step. How can we learn from nature, not just learn nature itself, not just study the mechanism, but really be inspired by nature? And this is a lesson for us as well. If we can be more connected as a society, as a scientific community, we can achieve more. And this is what we are doing, and this is what we're starting to do in my lab, where we reach out to the Forest Service in Israel, to the Forest Service in America, in US, and communicate the research with them. They fund some of our, of our research, we give back to them the results for many experiments that we do in service of their activities. We do that a, lo a lot in the global community of the scientific community, we collaborate with many labs around the world, and this is our way of communicating whatever we find to the benefit of the environment, to the survival of forest, to maintain the forest through collaboration. And I want to tell you about one specific collaboration that we have here with uh, an ETA scientist uh, named Professor Tom Crowther. He will be next, and he will show you how it takes this even further. We share our love for forest, Tom and I, and Tom is um, boldly taking this into act action. So he is in touch with afforestation bodies in all these different countries to make things happen now. And the science we do matter for that. 
Thank you very much.